upon our world, upon all those who suffer from any malady or suffering of any kind. Through your son Jesus, we know that we have new life in you. And we are grateful and we give you praise. In his name we pray, amen. amen. Please be seated, friends. I am, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And who believes in me will never be thirsty. Such was the, pres the promise of Jesus Christ to us. And yet, throughout the world, we know that people are hungry. And people thirst for good news, for water. Sometimes water is more than plentiful, as we saw through the flooding with Debbie. And sometimes water is lacking. St. Paul today is writing to the community of Ephesus from his prison cell. He's now arrested in Rome. He has had plenty of time to reflect on what a life worthy of the gospel would look like for his disciples and for you and me. He carefully describes the characteristics of what a Christian life should look like. Paul articulates that having all humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace looks like. The exhibition of those characteristics is all part of what a gospel-based life should be. And while none of us is perfect, we are capable, through Christ's abundant grace, of being so much more than we usually settle for. So much more. Because it's Christ who lives within us. Now, I recently visited my hometown, a little New England uh, city called Manchester, Connecticut, outside of Hartford, if anybody knows where that is. It's usually, people, the best way to describe it is, it's on the way to Boston. <laughs> <laughs> people get that. It's like, oh yeah. And my family and I were <clears throat> reminiscing about the high school we all attended and remembered a favorite teacher. His name was Gerald Brown. I mean, Mr. Brown. No one ever called him Jerry as, that I was aware of. Everyone called him Mr. Brown. And Mr. Brown taught biology. And he also coached football, whereby he became the living legend of Manchester, Connecticut. Now, I was back in grade school <clears throat> a long time ago, and he had heard, I had heard the stories, and I learned to be afraid, rather in awe of Mr. Brown, and those feelings of awe only increased when I was in junior high school. But it was in senior high school that I finally walked into Mr. Brown's classroom. And I was surprised, because I felt that he was larger than life itself. But Mr. Brown was rather a small man, with small rounded shoulders and small bones. His voice, instead of being commanding, it was soft. But it was his eyes that got to you. Those piercing brown eyes flashing there behind his glasses. 
Those brown eyes sparkle with humor and anger sometimes, and nobody challenged the personality behind those spectacles. I mean, no one got kicked out of his class. For all the decades that Mr. Brown taught class, I never heard of anyone being in trouble with Mr. Brown. You wouldn't have dared to raise a ruckus. He had expectations of us. That is, we were expected to come to class and to work in class, and you know what? We all did. We were expected to be disciplined in our studies, to do our homework, to participate in class, and we all did. We had that much respect for him. We were expected to be people of integrity, acting properly with manners and decorum, and we all followed suit. He never preached to us about these things, he didn't lecture us about these values. He simply embodied these values of work and discipline and integrity and kindness. And he expected no less from us. Now, how disappointed we would have been if we heard that Mr. Brown got drunk after Friday night football game. How disappointed we would have been if Mr. Brown ran off with that French teacher. How disappointed we would have been if we had all heard rumors about his family violence and hurting his wife or children. Not Mr. Brown of all people. We had higher expectations of him than that. We had double standards for him. We expected that of him, and we, he accepted it. We expected more of him because of who he was. Now, my younger brother has a small business that employs 200 people. Each year, he gives one plaque for excellence, and the title of that plaque for excellence is the Mr. Brown Award. Mr. Brown is an essential part of my brother's history as well, the town's history. A life worthy of the gospel is a life centered in God. It's a life that is modeled after Jesus Christ. A life worthy of the gospel is a life that recognizes the still, small voice of God speaking to us from deep within our being. We must learn to develop a practice of prayer in our lives so that the noises and bustle of the world do not distract us nor drown out God's words of love and acceptance. God wants us to embrace our belovedness. Once we begin to do this, we also will begin to see others as the beloved of God, as our sisters and our brothers. Jesus wants us to live out our lives in his love for others. There's a phrase, God invites us to our best life in him. Theologian Henry Nouwen writes, you cannot live in communion with God without living in solidarity with people. It's essentially the same. A life worthy of the gospel means that we discover, as God's beloved children, that we are meant to live in community with others. Paul stresses that the community gathered in Christ's name, such as the one here today, must be one in which unity thrives. Unity does not mean uniformity, however, and that's why there are many gifts from the Holy Spirit 
to assist us, to assist the members of the community live out their calling to fulfill the mission of Christ, to bring Christ's way upon earth to fruition. The Spirit has given us each gifts that are unique. Some of us are patient, while others are creative, and while others are kind. Each of our individual gifts is intended to be placed in service of the community to build up the body of Christ in this world. As we go about living a life worthy of the gospel, we must strive to nurture our relationship with Christ through regular reception of the Holy Eucharist. The body and blood of Christ feeds and heals our deepest hungers. Jesus recognized that the crowds in today's gospel were still seeking a sign, a miraculous, magical sign, rather than seeking a rela relationship with him. The crowd still clamored for more bread, and were oblivious to what God was doing for them in the person of Christ Jesus right in front of their faces. While wanting to fill their bellies, they ignored their deepest hunger for God's love made incarnate in Christ. As the old union song proclaims, as we go marching, marching, in the beauty of the day, a million darkened kitchens, a thousand mill lofts, gray, are touched with the radiance that a sudden sun discloses for the people, hear us singing, bread and roses, bread and roses. As we come marching, marching, we battle too for men, and women, for they are all in the struggle together, and together we shall win. Our days shall not be sweated from birth until our life closes. Hearts starve as well as bodies. Give us bread, but give us roses. In the twelve, in the 1200s, I believe, a saint <clears throat> called Benedict wrote what's called a rule of life, a series of proscriptions for his monks to follow. And the point is that it, that rule of life would govern their life together and help each individual monk grow holier in the following of those rules. Now, not following those rules did not mean expulsion from the community, but rather, when confessed to the community, they would be given another chance to begin again. And when I was in formation to become a priest, uh, we were asked at a, at a training meeting to write our own rule of life. It kind of structures our time, you know? Structures our time in Christ and focuses our attention on living a life worthy of the gospel. So today, Jesus invites all of his disciples, then and now, to move away from the easy and comfortable roads of life and enter into that life that exists only deep within Christ. Jesus says to us, I am the bread of life. And it is this bread, this life in Christ, which will sustain us from day to day, 
all the years of our life on this earth to more closely, more nearly follow him until we arrive at the heavenly city. So let us say with all our hearts, Jesus, give us your life always. And for this we pray, amen.